let's get into our sermon this morning. Uh, Lord, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for all the great things you've given us. You're a wonderful God. And Lord, even when things don't look amazing, you are with us. When there's only one set of footprints in the sand, it's you carrying us. And we thank you for that. And Lord, as we get into your word this morning, we just pray that you would open up our hearts and minds to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. So what I was actually going to do today... Uh, for sermon series, is I was actually going to start a series on the book of Jonah, which is an awesome little book. You may have heard of him. Uh, one of the most famous stories that many people are familiar with, Jonah and the Whale, or Jonah and the Big Fish. And so I actually thought before we do that, I'm going to do a bit of a prequel sermon and kind of set the scene for the state of Israel and the state of Judah, sort of a little bit just after the time of Jonah, and just show what Israel was like. And the reason I'm doing these series, I'm going to do the Sermon on Micah today and a little series on Jonah is I've been reading through the Minor Prophets in my devotions for a few weeks now, just taking my time going through it. And these are wonderful little books. And they're little books that really pack a powerful punch, an incredible punch. But they're also some of the books of the Bible that Christians are the least familiar with. And so what I thought it'd be cool to do is actually to look at them and look at some of the themes in them and the powerful things that they teach. And the reasons they are so powerful are many. There's many reasons why they're so powerful. But one of the reasons why they're so powerful is because they give a voice to how the ordinary believer was feeling when they saw the decadence and corruption of the nations of Israel and Judah. And we also see them cry out again and again for God's justice for God to act, for God to rescue them. And some of the uh, most common themes in these little books is, God, why are you taking so long to punish the wicked, O oh Lord? Why are the evil continuing to prosper? Why is true corruption going unpunished? And these, I suspect, for at least some of you, are calls that you can probably relate to in our world today. But if you really take a look at our society today, how bad is it really? How bad is it really? Well, the answer is pretty bad. That's just the honest answer. There's a lot of good things in our lives, but when you actually take stock of society, things are getting really bad. Think about it. The state of morality is bad. When drag queens are running story hour at the local library, and those who protested are seen as the bad guys. <laughs> and when we have shows, like one of the most popular shows on TV at the moment is called Maths. Married at First Sight, have you heard of it? When we have shows like that which make a mockery of marriage, then you have to say that the state of morality in our nation is pretty bad, isn't it? And the state of Western civilization is currently bad. In every metric of health, whether economic, social, or physical, the West is declining. And economically, Australians are starting to struggle and struggle and be crushed under an increasing weight of debt, which is actually breaking families, left, right, and center. The state of education isn't great at the moment either. Degrees, and the university students can relate to this, now cost more than ever before and are worth less than ever before. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the state of the average person's understanding of what is right, uh, right is bad. Up is down and down is up. And it reminds me of what it says in the book of Isaiah, woe to those who are called good, evil good and good evil. And the state of the collected <laughs> wisdom of the leaders of the West, which was once Christendom, is pretty bad, isn't it? I mean, they lurch from one international disaster to another. It's just incredible. So in many ways, our society is in a really bad shape. So the answer to that question is, how bad is it really? Pretty bad. But I'll tell you what, there is something in all of this in which I find encouragement. And I bet you weren't expecting me to say this right now, were you? <laughs> There's something in all of this in which I find encouragement. And what is it, you may ask? Well, Micah 7 is going to help us out with that, so that's why we're going to look at it this morning. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this little concluding chapter. We're going to look at the whole chapter of Micah chapter 7. We're going to see what Micah has to say about the state of his nation in his day. And then we're going to see how it applies to us today and what it can teach us today and how I think it can really encourage you. So on a note of encouragement, my first point is titled, Woe is Me. Oh, so, so, oh, you can see it up there. Woe is me. Micah says this is how it begins. <laughs> Verse 1. Woe is me, for I have become as when the summer fruit is being gathered, as when the grapes are being gleaned. There is no cluster to eat, no first ripe fig that my soul desires. Now some people are noticing the commentaries kind of debate over whether this is Micah talking or whether it's the state of Israel, nation, nation of Israel or Judah talking. But I think that's a sort of a strange discussion because everything that's said in Micah chapter 7 fits with the theme of the prophet's message as he's continually going through this book and addressing how he feels about his own nation. And the first thing he tells us is, woe is me. Now why does the prophet cry out, woe is me? Because he's in distress. He's heartbroken of what he sees happening in the nation that he loves. He loves it. He goes to, it's like a farmer who wants to reap his harvest and he goes to the fields and he can't even find grapes. He can't find any wheat. There's nothing to be gleaned. There's nothing there. The fruit is non-existent. He does not even have a cluster of grapes to eat or a ripe fig to satisfy his hunger. And what Micah is showing us here is that he's been ministering, working hard, trying to teach the people of Judah in Israel and lead them back to righteousness, to warn them about the danger of their sins and what their sins will do to the nation. But it's not working. People aren't listening. In fact, we actually see in chapter 2 it's worse than that. Micah 2 verse 6, people are telling him to shut up. Do not preach, they preach. One should not preach of such things. Disgrace will not overtake us. They tell him, stop it. Stop it, Micah. He's warning them about the dangers of their way of life. And they're complaining back to him that he's just too negative. That's not just a modern response to this kind of preaching. It's an ancient response. Thus they preach, he says. In other words, or but one should not preach of such things. Do not preach, they preach. In other words, what he's pointing out here is that the priests and the false prophets of the nation, the religious leaders, are actually setting themselves against him to try and make the people feel good about their sin and secure in their sin and to nullify his message of warning. They are contradicting his message and helping people feel okay about a destructive way of life. And this is dangerous. And the context of Micah's ministry really helps us have a bit of insight into the kind of culture that he's dealing with. We read this in Micah 1 verse 1. It tells us when he was preaching. The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. So what this Samaria is the northern kingdom of Israel. What this is telling us is that Micah was preaching in the final days of the northern kingdom and in the nearly final days leading up to the decline of the kingdom of Judah. And you can actually read, if you want to, uh, later on, you can read the history of this period in which he's preaching in 2 Kings 15 to 20. But we, we, he tells us here he preached amongst, uh, in the ministry of three kings. And the first one is Jotham. And Jotham, the Bible tells us that Jotham was actually a good king. He was a decent king. This is what it tells us in 15 verse 34, 2 Kings 15 34. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to all that his father Uzziah had done. So 2 Kings tells us that Jotham wasn't that bad. He was actually an honorable king who did the right thing. However, he had this big flaw. Verse 35, nevertheless, the high places were not removed. The people still sacrificed it and made offerings on the high places. He built the upper gate of the house of the Lord. So Jotham was a good king. He did what was right for himself, but he failed to deal with the idolatry of the high places in Israel. And what this did is this allowed the evil to kind of seep in all around him, all around the kingdom of Judah, and get entrenched because he didn't deal with it. And his son Ahaz reflects this because his son Ahaz was a wicked king. 2 Kings 16, 1-4. You might remember Ahaz from uh, Isaiah chapter 7. And the prophet Isaiah challenges him. 
2 Kings 16, wonderful. In the seventh year of Pekah, the son of Ramalia, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. He only lived till 36, and he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God as his father David had done. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, even burned his son as an offering according to the despicable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. And he sacrificed and made offerings on the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. So Jotham may have done what was right, but because he didn't deal with the high places and get rid of the idolatry, this evil seeped around and it eventually engulfed his son and took over his son. In fact, Ahaz gave himself over to evil and he was incredibly wicked. It tells us here he burnt his sons in the fire. And this was an evil practice, which the ancient Canaanites practiced. In fact, this practice was so wicked. We think of all the ancient pagan nations as pretty much equally wicked. And I can understand why you might think that. But the Canaanite practice, this practice was so despised by other cultures. I'll give you an example. The, the descendants of the Canaanites in a city called Carthage were still practicing it. And the Romans were so disgusted at it, it's one of the reasons why they burned the city to the ground and destroyed it. There was other reasons, but that was one of their motivations. They were so disgusted in it. It's incredible to think about that even ancient pagans would find this horrible. And it is a terrible practice. It's the height of evil. And the Israelites learned this from the, the Canaanites amongst which they lived. And they worshipped these gods called the Baals and the Asherahs, which really were just demons. And they're still active in the world today. They're still very active. But there was a ray of hope in the darkness, and his name was Hezekiah. <laughs> Hezekiah was a good king, and he's a very famous king. You might remember his prayer, Hezekiah's prayer. It's a very famous prayer. And he did what was right. 2 Kings 18, 1 to 6. In the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Judah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. And he was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to all that his father had done. He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan. He trusted the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings. Notice this. This is how good he was. He trusted in the Lord God so that there was none like him among all the kingdom, kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that the Lord God had commanded Moses. So Hezekiah was such a good king. He was such a good guy that he was compared favorably to all the kings before him and all the kings after him. That's a pretty good record, because who's in that record? You've got guys like David before him and Josiah after him. So he was a very good king in a lot of ways. But even this righteous man was not enough to save the declining nation. And who was Hezekiah's son? Manasseh. And Manasseh was one of the worst. Manasseh was one of the most wicked kings. Uh, who, who was even worse than Ahaz. And Manasseh was so wicked, so depraved, that in the time of Manasseh, God said, that's it, I've had enough. Judah, you're going into exile. That's how terrible Manasseh's sins was. The abominations that he committed sealed the fate of his nation. So even all the good, the moderate reforms that Hezekiah was able to do were not enough to turn around the nation because it was so corrupt in many ways. But also remember, Micah is, is addressing not just Judah, but the kingdom of Samaria, which is the northern kingdom of Israel. So you've got Israel, and it's, it's called Samaria because that was its capital, and yes, they are the descendants of the Samaritans. And then you've got Judah and Jerusalem. Uh, which, which was obviously the southern kingdom, which most people are familiar with. And remember, Micah is addressing the northern kingdom and in his message. And in the day he lived, when Micah was around, all the kings of Israel were wicked. There were no good kings of the northern kingdom. They were all evil. In fact, evil, Israel was so evil during Ahaz's day, when Micah was alive, 
that God sent them into exile, allowed the kingdom of Assyria to defeat them, and they were so utterly lost in that exile, the people of the northern kingdom, we're not even sure where their descendants are today. They might be in some of the uh, European peoples, some of the Middle East peoples, we're just not sure, because they were that dispersed across the earth. That's how harshly they were punished because of their wickedness. And the declining state of the nation of the northern kingdom of Samaria would have had a big effect on the kings of Judah for a very simple reason. Israel, the northern kingdom, was the more dominant power. And that means it had more influence. And a nation's allies influence often the way that they think in, about things about religion. And this is exactly what we're told in 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 3. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. Who was Ahaz influenced by? The kings of Israel his bigger ally to the north, who wasn't always an ally. Sometimes it turned on them. So the declining state of the nation of Israel would have had a very bad effect on Judah. And that's just the way of things. So Micah lived through the declining stages of two nations that he loved and the ending of the northern kingdom. This is a nation that he preached to, that he ministered to, and even saw faint rays of hope in guys like Hezekiah. And some commentators actually think that it's possible Micah lived to the days of Manasseh because a lot of what he says seems to apply to the wickedness under Manasseh as well. But we've got to remember it also applies to the northern kingdom, which was just utterly depraved at this time. And in Hezekiah's day, Judah was mostly overcome by Assyria as well. If you actually read the book of Isaiah, the book of two kings, you'll see that basically Assyria defeats it so badly that they're just left with nothing but Jerusalem. So we've looked at the geopolitical situation, what it's, the Bible says about that, the, the big picture. Now let's look at the, little, the inside view. What was it like from the inside? Well, from the inside, it was a broken nation. The situation in Israel and Judah in Micah's day is pretty desperate. It's a seriously broken nation. And Micah actually gives us an on-the-ground picture of what it was like. And his summary here gives us an incredibly clear picture of a nation where people have all turned against each other. Micah 7, verse 2 to 6. You might wonder, where's the encouragement coming, Matt? I thought this was an encouraging sermon. Just bear with me. <laughs> Micah 7, 2 to 6. The godly has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among mankind. They lie in wait for blood, and each hurts the other with a net. Their hands are on what is evil to do it well. The prince and the judge ask for a bribe, and the great man utters the evil desire of his soul. Thus they weave it together. The best of them is like a brier, the most upright of them a thorn hedge. The day of your watchman, of your punishment, is come. Now their confusion is at hand. Put no trust in a neighbor, have no confidence in a friend. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. For the son treats the father with contempt. The daughter rises up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. Wow, that is a powerful, powerful address. And this is a description of a people in serious and desperate moral decline. Micah gives us a picture of the real tragedy that was happening to his beloved people. Micah loves his people. But there's a real tragedy here. The godly have perished from the earth, and there's no one upright among mankind. This is another way of saying, where have all the good men gone? <laughs> where are all the good leaders gone? Where are all the good such and such gone? It's pretty much what he cries. Yeah, imagine the shock. Imagine the, the terrifying shock to the people of God in Judah when they saw the entire kingdom of Samaria, not just wiped out, but their people just spread all over the earth, never to be seen again, lost to history. And they saw it happen. They saw the beginning of that. Mention what that, and remember, not everyone in the northern kingdom was evil. We know that because we have books written by prophets in the northern kingdom who were righteous men. So not everyone, so the, the righteous and the wicked perished alike. Could you imagine how terrifying that was for the people in Judah? And because the society is fracturing, corruption is increasing. 
the righteous were being pushed out of influence in the temple, in the synagogues, in the marketplace, in the palace, and everywhere. Everywhere Micah looked, evil was taking more and more power, and the moderate reforms of Hezekiah were not enough to turn it around. The evil was that entrenched. And they all lie in wait for blood, and each hurts the other with a net. Their hands are on what is evil to do it well. People are so wicked and so overcome by evil that they're seeking to tear each other down. People lie in wait for an opportunity to destroy their opponent or their enemy or their neighbor, and they hatch evil plans, and they're diligent about it. And the way that the Israelites and the Judeans treated each other is actually legendary. And here's just a couple of examples from the book of Micah itself. They covet fields and seize them, and houses and take them away. They oppress a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. The women of my people you drive out from their delightful houses, from their young children you take away my splendor forever. They're treating people so poorly, they're driving the people in the land into homelessness. And you know what? That's happening in our nation today. I read an article last night, a couple. They were on a combined income of $100,000, and they're living in a tent because they can't get a rental. Anywhere, anywhere near. They had to send their children two hours away to live with family or friends. because, And that, that story is happening daily in increasing numbers. And it's starting to really affect people. Rather than seeking to be their neighbors, they seek to take control over their neighbor's property. It sounds like a very modern problem, doesn't it? Because this is a very consistent problem when a nation is given over to wickedness. The same patterns repeat. The same patterns repeat. And what's interesting is it talks about scheming and plotting. <laughs> if you notice that scheming and plotting is kind of becoming like the, the consistent theme in so many shows on TV or streaming networks these days. I mean, the old daytime soaps, that's what they were about. You remember that? It was like some businessman or whatever, or some businesswoman is going to try and take down some other businesswoman. It's like big intricate plots about how they're trying to take each other out. Or, that's my memory of it. Anyway, I didn't watch that many episodes. <laughs> but that's what the soapies were like. But now that kind of storyline has kind of taken over many of the shows. Many of the most popular shows at the moment, that's what they're about. And they are filled with morally ambiguous people where no one is really the good guy or the bad guy. They're all, but they're all experts at doing evil. Have you noticed that? It's becoming very common. And this culture is affecting our society as well. Bonds are breaking all over the place. All over the place. And the prince and the judge ask for a bribe, and the great man utters the evil desire of his soul. Thus they weave it together. The best of them is like a brea, the most upright of them a thorn hedge. The day of your watchman, of your punishment has come. Now their confusion is at hand. These nations have become so corrupt, so evil, so decadent, that, ev that all their best leaders were bought and paid for by powerful moneyed interests. That's what that's saying. <laughs> Does it sound familiar? The prince... That means the rulers, from the king to the nobles to local tribal chiefs, ask for a bribe to do their job. The judges do the same. And it says they weave it together. What does that mean? They weave it together. What does that mean? Work together, yes. But it also means that they conspire, they conspire behind closed doors to do evil and profit from it. They make intricate plots like a web. What do you do with a web? You weave a web. Why? to catch things. Publicly they say they are for justice behind closed doors. They meet in secret rooms to hatch evil plans. They weave a web like spiders to catch their prey. And we also know this because he says it pretty much directly in verse 2. Each hunts the other with a net and the best of them is like a bria, a thorn hedge. In other words, that people get stuck by them, caught by them, trapped. This is the kind of leadership they have. And these people he's talking about here in the passage of Micah, they're not just fallen leaders who are trying to do their best, imperfect leaders just trying hard. They are generally evil leaders who are intentionally seeking to do evil. And how do you tell the difference between a flawed leader and an evil leader? Because every leader is flawed, really, even the best. But how do you tell the difference? Well, you judge the fruit of their governance. You simply judge the fruit. You don't need to know all the details of their life, just what fruit they have. And here's some questions I've got. And think about this in the context of our nation. Are people getting poorer? Are the poorer being left further and further behind? 
Do they support evil policies like child sacrifice, or we call it today abortion? Yes. Do they support things like Asherah worship, which we today call feminism and transgenderism? Yes. Do they support the bondage of their citizens? We call that today easy debt. <laughs> Do they turn the nation towards evil or good? And when you see the fruit of that kind of leadership, you know that behind the scenes there's evil, because that's what the scriptures is telling us. And it was not just the leaders who were bad, though. It went all the way down. Put no trust in a neighbor. Have no confidence in a friend. Put, guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. For the son treats the father with contempt. The daughter rises up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. Relationships across the whole nation are falling apart. Neighbor against neighbor, friend against friend, everyone's words being used against them. The son treats the father poorly, the daughter treats the mother poorly. There is no safe haven for people across the nation. People are starting to feel more and more isolated. There is no loyalty in the nation, at least it is rare. And let me ask you this question. Do we see this happening in our country today? You know, I wondered whether I should mention this, but I will mention it because it's interesting. Well, I think it's interesting. You might not think it is. <laughs> but sometimes I watch uh, these guys on YouTube. Uh, that some people call them men's rights activists or stuff like that. You might have heard. Pardon? I try not to watch the MGTOW guys. They're too depressing. Uh, but uh, some, sometimes I watch these guys. But I don't watch them all the time for that very reason. They can be a bit whiny and very negative. <laughs> There's only so much of that you can take. But the reason I watch them is because I think it's important to have a bit of a finger on the pulse of the state of the average person's experience in our nation and, and what unbelievers are dealing with. And one of the things that I'll see again and again and again is how quickly these guys will talk about that women turn on their husbands, but also how quickly also that men turn on their wives. It goes both ways. It's not like women are worse than men or men are worse than women. It, it goes bad both ways. He says here, uh, Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. In other words, you can't even trust the person you're closest to. And I'll see that these guys will talk about how often boyfriends will turn on girlfriends and girlfriends will turn on boyfriends. And some of the stories out there are horrific, like absolutely horrific. And they're increasing. At least it appears so. so and I see this and I see the, the state of dating and relationships today, I feel for the young people because it looks like it's fraught with a lot of dangers. And it really makes me thankful for the family I have, for the wife that I have. It makes me so thankful. It makes me thankful for the friends that I have and the church that I have. It makes me so thankful. It really makes me thankful for the kind of people I have around me in other contexts. Because it's really important. But out there, there is a real dog-eat-dog -dog battle going on for a lot of people in society. And our nation is not much different to what Micah describes here in Micah chapter 2 verses, sorry, 7, 2 to 6. Micah is describing a nation that is in a really bad place, a very bad place. And it's actually a little depressing to think about a nation being in such a bad place. And it's doubly bad when you think about the fact that what he says applies so consistently to our own nation today. It can be a little bit overwhelming to think about. There are so many parallels to our own, right on down in our nation, to increasing corruption, injustice, and homelessness, and, and child sacrifice, abortion, all these things. Young people between the ages of 24 and 34 are being driven into homelessness at increasing rates. And your life might be OK right now, and I pray to God it is. But, then, but are things getting to be a little bit expensive? And it's becoming to be a little bit of a, a worry because things are getting tough. And being a Christian is becoming a little bit harder and harder in certain contexts. And as I mentioned, child sacrifice, abortion is on the rise. There is still good in our nation. You can see it all over the place. There is still a lot of good. We get to experience it a lot. But evil is also on the rise. And much of that evil that Micah was seeing in his day, we are seeing today, and it is growing, it is not decreasing. But I said at the beginning of this sermon that it was going to be an encouraging message, <laughs> or that I saw something encouraging in all of this. So what on earth can that be after everything 
that we've looked at now? Well, two things, let me show you. Firstly, and this gives me great hope, Micah never gave up. Micah 7, 7 to 17. But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. Until he pleads my cause and executes judgment for me, he will bring me out to the light. I shall look upon his vindication. Then my enemy will see and shame will cover her who said to me, Where is the Lord your God? My eyes will look upon her. Now she will be trampled down like the mire of the streets. A day for the building of your walls. In that day the boundary shall be extended. In that day they will come to you from Assyria and the cities of Egypt, from Egypt to the river, from the sea and from the mountain to the mountain. But the earth will be desolate because of its inhabitants. For the fruit of their deeds, shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your inheritance, who dwells alone in a forest in the midst of a garden of the land. Let them graze in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old, as in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt. I will show them marvelous things. The nations shall see and be ashamed of their might. They shall lay down their hands on their mouths. Their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent, like the crawling things of the earth. They shall become trembling out of their strongholds. They shall turn in dread to the Lord our God, and they shall be in fear of you. you know, no matter how bad things got, and it got really bad in Micah's day. He never gave up hope in the faithfulness of God. Not what? Well, at least not in this passage. I don't know what happened in every day of his life, but <laughs> we know that he held on at the end. And he knew that himself was not perfect. And he knew in some ways God was disciplining him for his sin. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. Until he pleads my cords and executes judgment for me, he will bring me to the light. I shall look upon his vindication. In other words, Micah saw many of the terrible things that were happening, at least partially through the lens of God was disciplining him. And what do we know about God's discipline? What do we know? What does the Bible say? God disciplines who? Those he loves. God disciplines those he loves. And he knew that God had his best intentions for him and for all who trusted in him. And he also knew that God would deal with his enemies. It says here, Then my enemies will see and shame will cover her who said to me, Where is your Lord God now? My eyes will look upon her now. She will be trampled down like the mire of the streets. And he gives an example of some woman we have no idea who she is, who said to him, Aha, where's your God, oh preacher man? You know, or something along those lines. Like, you know, where is he now? Like, and he knows that God's going to vindicate him. Because he's seeking to trust in the Lord. And he knows that God is on the side of his children and those who trust in him. Even when it doesn't feel like it. Even when it doesn't seem like it. God is there. And Micah never gave up on this. And he also knew that God would lift up his people again. He knew that too. He had seen the future and he had seen that Zion would reign above the nations. As in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, I will show them marvelous things. The nations shall see and be ashamed of all their might. They shall lay down their hands on their mouths. Their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent, like the crawling things of the earth. They shall come trembling out of their strongholds. They shall turn to dread to the Lord our God, and they shall be in fear of you. We see this fulfilled about the Mount Zion uh, and rolling over the nations in Hebrews chapter 12 and in Revelation chapter 21. And, and we know there that Zion is the people of God and all who come to the people of God will be vindicated and lifted up. The evil nations of the earth won't win. God will win. And those who trust in him will experience this. And Micah looked forward to this day. He saw that this day was coming. See, Micah remained stalwart in a day and age when all around him, when everything for his people was breaking apart from kingdoms to relationships between people, he remained faithful. He saw the bonds of family, friendship, and more breaking apart. And he stayed firm in his principles and beliefs, trusting in God. And he knew he wasn't perfect. He says it. He says it in the passage. And I take encouragement from that because that is something that we all can do too. That is something that we can all do. In fact, it's all God really requires of us. What does God require of us? To fear God and obey his commandments, to trust him. That's all we need to do. See, the rest is on his shoulders. The state of society is on his shoulders, not ours. 
We don't have to worry about that. It's not our pressure, it's his pressure. And Micah sees that and he gives it to the Lord. No matter what breaks down around us, we can stand firm like Micah. And we can help each other in that. But also this, this is the other thing that that really encourages me about this passage. And what encourages me about this passage is that we are reading it today. What I mean by that. Look what it says in verses 18 to 20. Who is a God like you, pardoning in iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of its inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. I want you to think about for a second again what Micah's day was like. I want you to think about how bad most of the kings were, all the kings of Israel and and, and a lot of the kings of Judah, how bad most of the prophets were, how bad most of the priests were. Think about how bad most of the people were, how every bond was being shattered, family, national bonds, religious bonds, all of it. His whole religion seemed around him to be falling apart, right? And yet we are reading the words of this prophet today. Why? Because they were passed on. They were passed on to the next generation, who passed it on to the next generation, who passed it on to the generations after that. In other words, the line of righteousness was never broken. No matter how bad things got, the line of the righteous people was never broken. It's not as if we found this book in a cave someday and recovered it. That's not what happened. Micah's words never disappeared. They remained in the faithful community from generation to generation, encouraging people that no matter how bad it looks, God is going to build his church. God's going to keep building his church. And sometimes there might be periods of decline and sometimes periods of increase. But no matter what, if you remain faithful in him, you'll get to experience this unbroken line. You'll get to be a part of it. In fact, we remain faithful. We hand it on to the next generation. Many of the mothers in this room are already doing that, handing it on to their children and teaching them the word of the Lord. So no matter how bad it got, it never got bad enough to expunge the righteous line from this world. And you know what? It never will. It never will. We're on the winning team, folks. We are on the winning team, even when it doesn't feel like it. It doesn't matter what's happening out there. Where's our God? Over it all. He's above it all. And if we trust in him, we trust in the one like Micah, who says, who is a God like you? who was over it all. And it will continue beyond us as well. And look, even if Christians today, some Christians aren't faithful, those who are will get to experience it. So let me encourage you to remain in that faithfulness. And the the cool thing about it is, is Micah knew this would happen. He saw it. He knew it would happen. He didn't black pill. He didn't give up. He kept in faith. He trusted God to forgive the sin of his people, and God did. He trusted God to have compassion on his people, and God did. He trusted God to fulfill his promises to the descendants of Abraham, just like he had always done, and God did. How can you not help but be encouraged by that? That's a, it's incredible. But Michael also, sorry, did I say Michael? Micah <laughs> also saw that God would provide a way for forgiveness to be given, for forgiveness of sins to be forgiven. Look at this. He will have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast our sins into the depths of the sea. You know, this is important. The Bible doesn't preach judgment because God wants to condemn people. That's not why the Bible preaches judgment. The Bible preaches judgment so people can be warned, so they can repent, and so God can save them. God does not desire that anyone should perish, but all those should repent and be saved. That's a verse straight from Ezekiel. But you know what? The Old Covenant 
doesn't show us how sins are dealt with, does it? Can the blood of bulls and goats deal with sin? Not at all. It's not enough. So Micah has to be looking forward to something else because the blood of bulls and goats is not going to cover it. It's just a shadow. But God made a way. He didn't find a way. He made a way. He had it pre-planned. He planned that a righteous child would be born from a godly mother and that child would be both God and man and live a perfect life, the life that we cannot live, and die the death that we deserve. And who was that boy? Well, his name was Jesus. And who was his mother? Well, her name was Mary. And through that child, God saved the world. Now, this is not a Mother's Day sermon. I've already mentioned that at the start. (laughs) It's not. By any means. However, this is as good a day as any to remind people that when God wanted to save the world, he chose to bring his son into the world through a godly mother who was part of his plan for raising that child along with her husband, Joseph. In other words, she was the cradle through which God brought the saviour of the world so that the prophecy of Micah looking forward to the day when he will tread our iniquities underfoot could be fulfilled. And it is only through that son It is only through the Lord Jesus Christ that we can be saved from our sins. Our Lord was born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, and then died a cruel and painful death for us so that we could be saved, for Micah, for Micah's people, so that we could be saved. And Micah saw this day coming, and he looked forward to it, and it gave him hope. And we live on the other side of it. He looked forward to it, we look back to it. But just like Micah, it should give us an unwavering hope. Because I can't remember how many hundreds of years, it was probably about 700 years, I think, before Jesus came that Micah wrote this. But when he said, God will tread our iniquities underfoot, he meant it and he was right. And if you've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what he's done for you. And he's cast them into the sea. (laughs) That's another way of saying he will move them as far from us as the east is from the west. That's how good our God is. Again, how can this not encourage your faith? I told you this was an encouraging passage. We just had to get there. So how do we apply this this morning? Well, my, my, my application to you is very simple. Don't get discouraged. You know, some people get to be St. Patrick, and they get to see an entire nation saved from paganism. And some people get to be Jeremiah <laughs> and see an entire nation destroyed by paganism. Some people get to be St. Paul and get to use the roads of Rome to take the gospel to the entire known world and be used by God to save Rome and the world. And some people get to be St. Augustine who saw the decline of Rome. It's not our lot to choose what what day we get to be in. It's just our lot to choose to be faithful no matter what. I encourage you Be faithful. Because after the days of an Augustine, after the days of a Jeremiah, often come the days of a St. Patrick and the days of a Paul. And it's those who held on when things looked really bad who are part of the, the soil which God uses to bring the good days. So continue to hold on. Don't get discouraged. And again, don't give up. No matter how things bad things get around you, don't give up your faith your family, your fellowship. Praise God that you are surrounded by other Christians who will stand by you when things get tough. And praise God that you have the same God as Micah, who proved his faithfulness again and again and again. And see, Micah passed on his message. He was faithful in in his belief in God, and he passed on his message to the next generation and to the next because of that. And so my prayer encouragement to you this morning is let's pray that we will be faithful too. And that we will carry on the line of Micah. And that our children will carry on the line of Micah. And the line of the righteous. And share people this message. That no matter how bad things look in society, God is at work. And when God is at work, good things will happen. Let's pray.
Lord, we thank you for your righteousness, your grace, your truth. We thank you for the kind of God you are. And we thank you that no matter what happened in Micah's day, you were there. And we thank you that you will carry us through when we feel like we can't carry ourselves. And Lord, I just want to pray again for each and every single one of us this morning that you would strengthen us through the power of your spirit to be faithful. Help us to not feel the burden uh, too much of what's happening in our society, but to recognize that that's, you carry that on your shoulders. Just help us to do our part to be faithful where you've called us to be, as mothers, as fathers, as employees, as wherever we are, Lord. Just help us to be the faithful witnesses you've called us to be. And help us to never forget the good and gracious gift that you gave to us when you trampled our sins underfoot through the work of your Son. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm-hmm.